Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinions Force. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today is Friday, February 15th. And uh, man, I'm excited. It's been a long, busy week. Uh, I haven't shaved. I got to get a haircut this weekend. I'm actually going home this weekend. I can't wait. Um, my dad's birthday. Uh, I want to just jump right in, bro. I don't want to waste your time. I want to start with the most important news of the day. The one, this is the, the one story this week I got so excited for and just couldn't, uh, I couldn't stop writing about it. I was very interested and it's been weird getting a lot of feedback from people who feel very strongly and very differently than I do about this. So the Denver Broncos have traded for quarterback Joe Flacco. And uh, I am so excited about this. I think this is a great move. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic idea. I guess I'm the only person in the world who thinks this is a good move. A lot of people have given me a lot of flack. They're like, Zach, you're an idiot. It's a terrible move. Ah, da, 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 da. Um, the Ravens traded away Joe Flacco because they believe they found their next quarterback, their next franchise quarterback, Lamar Jackson. So that leaves us with Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco is now the Broncos quarterback. He's 34 years old. He was a Super Bowl MVP at the end of the 2012 season. He's got a history. He's won a Super Bowl. He's not a terrible quarterback. Now, many people hate this move. They've been very critical. They say things like, there's memes literally where people are saying, you know, the Broncos replaced a bad quarterback with just another bad quarterback. And I, I get where they're coming from, but personally, I think this is a great move. You know, I, I think the Broncos played a game of would you rather. You ever play the game would you rather? Usually you have two options and you have to decide which is which option would you like. Neither is usually ideal, but it's fun to like decide. If you're put in a situation, you have two options, which would you rather have? The Broncos did that with their quarterback situation. You know, keep in mind the Broncos just hired defensive minded head coach Vic Fangio. They have a really good defense. They have some the problem is their defense is aging. They have older players that are their window of opportunity, their window of success is, is closing very quickly. They have aging wide receivers, Emmanuel Sanders. They have a really good running back, Bill Blimsey, who's really good right now. They have a Pro Bowl running back. The problem is running back careers are very fast. They're like flashes in the pan. So if you have a good running back, you want to capitalize on that while you have it. So I, I really believe that the Denver Broncos looked at their organization, looked at all the pieces they had in place, and they asked themselves, would you rather have a rookie quarterback you need to develop or a veteran quarterback, Joe Flacco, who's won a Super Bowl in the past. So the end of the 2012 season, in the playoffs, Joe Flacco was incredible. He had 11 touchdowns, no interceptions. He was Super Bowl MVP. He was great. In 2012, Joe Flacco was a big deal. He looked like he was the next big thing. The problem was right after that Super Bowl, he dropped off a cliff. He did not live up to what he'd done previously. I mean, the numbers don't lie. Joe Flacco was not as good after winning the Super Bowl. Since 2013, according to NFL.com, Joe Flacco ranks 35th in passing yards per attempt. He had 6.5 and 34th in touchdown to interception ratio with 110 touchdowns, 80 interceptions. He also is 34th out of 36 quarterbacks in pass rating with a pass rating of 82.3. I want you to recognize, again, he's ranked 34th and 35th. Only 36 quarterbacks were eligible to be included in this ranking. You had to have a minimum of 1,000 pass attempts. It's also worth noting, he was ranked 35th and 34th in a league where there's only 32 starting quarterbacks. That is not, not good at all. However, I think you can explain Joe Flacco's struggles. You can explain the reason why Joe Flacco's been struggling as of late can be attributed to his lack of consistency on offense. What no one talks about, what nobody acknowledges is the fact that the Baltimore Ravens have had six different offensive coordinators since 2012. And at one point, Joe Flacco had five offensive coordinators in five seasons. Now, two of them did really well. Jim Caldwell and Gary Kubiak did really, really well. They were his first two coordinators after winning a Super Bowl, and they moved on to get head coaching jobs. But two of them did not do well. They were fired midseason. Mark Trestman was not, not a good fit. Couple of, I can't remember the name of the other guy, but the point is there has been a ton, a ton of turnover in the Baltimore Ravens franchise at offensive coordinator. We all blame Joe Flacco, but nobody acknowledges, nobody talks about the fact that Joe Flacco had an incredible 
lack of consistency from the offensive coordinator position. He had to learn new system after new system after new system, always learning how to work with a different coach. So I really think you can attribute all of Joe Flacco's struggles statistically to the fact that he never had a consistent offensive coordinator. Now, personally, I believe trading for Joe Flacco was a really, really good move for the Denver Broncos. The Denver Broncos have the pieces they need to win right now. I mean, here's the, the Broncos could do what everyone else would do. They could bring in a rookie quarterback. But by the time a rookie quarterback figures it out in two to three years, your defense is way older, probably out of their prime. Philip Lindsay, your really good running back, he lost his best years. And not to mention, if you bring in a rookie quarterback, you got to remember the Broncos have a defensive-minded head coach. They have Vic Fangio, a great, great defensive-minded head coach. But if you look at the, the way things have worked out in the past, rookie quarterbacks and defensive-minded head coaches are a really, really bad pair. They're not a good combination. L look around the league recently. Steve Wilkes was fired after one year with rookie quarterback Josh Rosen. Todd Bowles fired after one year. Sam Darnold was his quarterback, rookie. John Fox was fired after one year in Chicago after one season with rookie quarterback Mitchell Drabisky, and Jeff Fisher was fired after just one year with Jared Goff. After the consistent thing is, if you have a rookie quarterback and you're a defensive-minded head coach, you do not stick around. You get fired. It doesn't work. I can't tell you why. I know they have offensive coaches. It's different. It's separated. But for whatever reason, defensive-minded head coaches and rookie quarterbacks simply do not do very well together. There's only one I can think of recently that succeeded. It's, the, it's Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll, and they're the exception. They're not the rule. Again, Steve Wilkes, Todd Bowles, John Fox, Jeff Fisher, all fired after just one year with a rookie quarterback. Rookie quarterbacks and defensive-minded head coaches, particularly first-time head coaches, do not do very well together. I think you also need to look at how the Joe Flacco trade benefits the Denver Broncos in the NFL draft. So right now, the Denver Broncos have a first-round pick. They're the 10th overall pick in the 2019 NFL draft. Instead of using it on a quarterback, you can build your roster. You can get a defensive player that helps you win, or you can get an offensive lineman, like an offensive tackle, which is a really big need for the Denver Broncos. Having a quarterback taking care of that now really benefits you so you can build your roster through the draft. Also, you know, a lot of the quarterbacks people are throwing around, I'm not sold on any of them. You know, there's one quarterback I really like, Dwayne Haskins. Um, I'm really interested in Kyler Murray. I haven't looked at the film enough. But the two names everyone's associating with the Denver Broncos, Daniel Jones and Drew Locke, they're a whole lot of meh. They're just meh. I'm not sold on either of these guys. So instead of using, instead of overdrafting a quarterback and getting a guy who might not work out, the Broncos can use their first-round draft pick, their second-round draft pick, to get impact players, maybe a defensive player, maybe an offensive tackle. And then in the later rounds, you could draft a quarterback like Tyree Jackson, the guy from Buffalo, who has a ton of potential, a huge arm. He's a really smart kid, but he's never had a private quarterback coach. And so Tyree Jackson needs a year to sit, a year to learn behind an older quarterback. Tyree Jackson is a great fit for the Denver Broncos because they have Joe Flacco and don't need to have Tyree Jackson play immediately. So I don't know. I think, you know, Broncos fans got to ask themselves, would you rather have Joe Flacco who can play or a rookie quarterback who's going to suck for a couple of years? I don't know. I, I would rather have Joe Flacco. And, and look at who the Broncos have hired. The Broncos have hired offensive coaching that could really, really help Joe Flacco. So the new offensive coordinator for the Denver Broncos is Rich Scangarello. His last job was as quarterback coach with the San Francisco 49ers. If you know the history of the 49ers, they have played musical chairs at quarterback for the last couple of years. They've, in fact, since 2017, in the last two seasons, the San Francisco 49ers have had four different quarterbacks start at least six games in one season. And despite that, despite all the turnover, despite the fact that they've had really no consistency at quarterback in San Francisco, the 49ers have been ranked 10th in passing in the last two years, and they completed over 60% of their passes, all four of those quarterbacks combined. So with the, some consistency, imagine what the coaches could do with Joe Flacco. 
Because everywhere they've been, Rich Gangarello has gotten the most out of his quarterbacks. You look at the Broncos right now. They have a really good offensive coordinator in place to help Joe Flacco. You have a Pro Bowl running back, Philip Lindsay. You have two good wide receivers, Emmanuel Sanders and Cortland Sutton. And if the Broncos can get healthy at tight end, you have Jake Budd, a really good tight end. You have Jeff Herman, two good tight ends. You got a really good offense you can build around Joe Flacco. Not to mention the defensive-minded head coach, Vic Fangio. He's a wonderful defensive mind. He's a great defensive coordinator. Pair him with guys like Bradley Chubb, Von Miller. That's a match made in heaven. I can't wait to watch the Denver Broncos. Look, I, I really believe Joe Flacco can work with the Denver Broncos. He fits the Denver weather really well. Um, and look, I just transferred colleges. I am the first one to say, sometimes a change of, change of scenery, sometimes a chance to reset, to be around different people and, and really to restart your, your, to reset your life. That can make a massive difference for someone. And so I, I think Joe Flacco could really, really do well with the Denver Broncos. I don't believe the Broncos are going to win the Super Bowl. I'm not saying that. I think mostly that's because of the AFC. You know, I have the Colts, the Texans, the Chiefs, the Patriots, the Ravens, the Chargers, the, the Browns are suddenly really good. The AFC is stacked. I'm not saying the Denver Broncos are going to win the Super Bowl because they traded for Joe Flacco. But I do believe the Denver Broncos belong in that conversation. And I'm excited to see what happens. Like, I might be dead wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll own it. I've done it in the past. I'm willing to be wrong. But personally, I believe Trading for Joe Flacco was a really, really smart move by the Denver Broncos. Uh, now, here's a rebuttal. The Broncos traded for quarterback Joe Flacco. And I, I believe the benefit to the Broncos was the fact that they don't have to spend time developing a young quarterback. They have an aging defense, a, quarter, a running back that's good right now. They have older wide receivers. They have a short window right now where they can win. Now, one reason why Broncos fans might be frustrated with this move at quarterback is because it's been a long time since the Broncos tried to do it right and develop a young quarterback. The one time the Broncos tried it, they got a late round pick. They picked Paxton Lynch at the very end of the first round, and he didn't work. And last year in the NFL draft, they had a top pick, and the Broncos didn't draft a quarterback. They drafted Bradley Chubb instead, a defensive end. And their answer at quarterback was to sign marginal free agent quarterback Case Keenum. The Broncos have tried everything at quarterback. They've tried everything except for draft a quarterback in the top 10. And none of those things worked. So I understand if Broncos fans are frustrated, I get it. Look, they tried developing second round quarterback Brock Osweiler after Peyton Manning. That failed. Then they picked a quarterback in the late first round, Paxton Lynch. That failed. Trevor Simeon, failed. Marginal quarterback, Case Keenum, signed him as a free agent. That failed. The only thing the Broncos haven't done, again, is draft a quarterback in the top 10. So you could, you could argue that because the Broncos just traded for Joe Flacco, they are taking a shortcut. They're not willing to spend the time to develop a young rookie quarterback. That's a valid argument. I understand that. I don't know. I don't think, if I'm the Broncos, I wouldn't want to, you have a team that can win right now. I wouldn't want to take the time to develop a young quarterback. But maybe that's what the Broncos are doing. Maybe Broncos fans want that. Maybe Broncos fans wants, maybe Broncos fans want years of struggle, years of developing a young quarterback. Like the Jets just had. The Jets <laughs> did not do well last year with a rookie quarterback. It's hard to win with a rookie quarterback when you have a bad franchise. I don't know. I don't know, but that, that could be, I understand where Broncos fans are coming from, why they might be frustrated in the Joe Flacco trade. Maybe they just want their franchise to invest in a young quarterback and take the time it needs to develop a young kid. So since the Broncos traded for Joe Flacco, the question next is, what happens with Case Keenum, their former quarterback? It's expected that the Broncos will release Case Keenum. And uh, my best guess is that Case Keenum signs with the New York Giants. Former offensive coordinator, he was uh, Pat Shermer with the Vikings. Pat Shermer and Case Keenum have history together. Pat Shermer is now the head coach of New York. And I think he could be a solid addition to the quarterback room. Put Case Keenum in New York with the Giants. The only weirdness about that is that the Giants also still have 
veteran quarterback Eli Manning, the guy who seems to be completely unwilling to resign. <laughs> it's so weird to me. It's like, let it go, man. It's over. Walk away. Uh, but for whatever reason, Eli Manning does not seem to be interested in retiring anytime soon. And uh, that could be weirdness. I, I don't know. I think my best bet is Case Keenum ends up with the New York Giants. Okay, we have a great show today. We're going to talk about Khalil Mack. We'll talk about the Khalil Mack trade, why that trade was really good for the Oakland Raiders. The Oakland Raiders, the LA Raiders, the Vegas Raiders. They're going to Vegas. And for a little bit longer, they will be the Oakland Raiders. Uh, we're going to talk about a huge move that happened in the NBA, why I'm so excited about it, and what that did to change the fortunes of the NBA Eastern Conference. We'll talk about the Alliance of American Football Week 2. We'll do a preview. I'll pick each, each, uh, all four of those games and tell you where you can watch them. We'll talk about Kyler Murray. And, and remember, please, if you like Strong Opinion Sports, you can subscribe on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube, as well as my shorter little breakout clips, topic by topic. Help me grow by telling your friends about this show. <clears throat> I want to briefly say, because I'm allowed to say whatever I want. It's my show. Um, <laughs> yesterday was Valentine's Day, and I think Valentine's Day is really weird. Um, it's, it's just, uh, I don't get it. It's on one hand, like I understand all these people are posting things on social media, like, Oh, I'm alone on Valentine's day. It's not fun. It's just another day. You're, you're alone every single night. Why does Valentine's day change your, your approach? I don't get it at all. But here's what's even weirder about Valentine's day. If I may, uh, you see all these people suddenly trying really, really hard to make their significant other happy. And my question is, what about every other day? I, I, don't, I don't understand. I, it, only on Valentine's Day do I give all this effort and try to love this person. I don't, I don't know. Shouldn't you put all that effort in on every single day of the week? Valentine's Day is weird. I don't, I don't get it. I rest my case. I have nothing to do with sports. I just, I, I, it's bizarre to me. I don't quite understand. I want to talk now about Khalil Mack. So last season, the Raiders traded away two of their best players. They traded away Khalil Mack, defensive end, and they traded away their, one of their wide receivers, Amari Cooper. Two of the best players on their roster, I might add, too. This was a, these were seismic moves for the Raiders franchise. And according to the Raiders' left tackle, Donald Penn, the moves took a toll on their roster. They really, really hurt morale in their locker room. Especially the Khalil Mack trade. The Khalil Mack trade really, really seemed to have an impact on the Raiders' locker room. His, his new team, the Chicago Bears, gave him a massive contract. They signed him to a six-year deal worth $141 million. That's the most of any defensive player ever in NFL history. And, and what's even, to make things worse, week one and two, right after that new contract and right after the trade, against the Packers and against the Seahawks, Khalil Mack dominated. I understand how it looks like that trade was really, really bad for the Raiders. They got rid of a really good player. Khalil Mack went to the Bears. He killed it. They made the playoffs. They had a better season than before. Despite the perception, though, I actually believe that trade was really, really good for the Raiders. Getting rid of Khalil Mack, I think, helped the Raiders long term. I know it's weird, but you look at the spot the Raiders are in right now. Things are going well. They have... Right about $70 million of cap space. They're one of the top teams in the NFL with cap space to work with and to add players and to sign players in the 2019 offseason. And in the next two NFL drafts, the Raiders have five first-round draft picks. They're in good shape. A lot of, they have a lot of money to spend, and they're going to bring in a lot of young new players to their franchise. And I will acknowledge, the Raiders went 4-12 in 2018. Last year, the Raiders went 4-12. and But I don't know how much Khalil Mack would have really helped them. You know, the Raiders had Khalil Mack. Would they have suddenly made the playoffs? Would he have really put the Raiders over the edge? I don't think so. I don't know that Khalil Mack would have had a massive impact on the Raiders last year. And now, it's, what's worth noting, too, is in 2017, even with Khalil Mack, the Raiders went 6-10. and so losing Khalil Mack, what that did was it, Khalil Mack swung two games. You have Khalil Mack, you won six games. You lose Khalil Mack, you only win four. How big of an impact did he really have on the Raiders franchise? 
In fact, Khalil Mack, you can argue, had a far greater impact on the Chicago Bears, who were in far better position to use Khalil Mack. The Bears already had a really good defense. Then you add Khalil Mack, and you're even better. You're a playoff team. But also, let's acknowledge, so the Bears went 12-4 and in 2018, and the year prior, in 2017, the Bears were only 5-11. and so you could say, well, Khalil Mack, yeah, he made the difference. Khalil Mack won them seven more games. But that's not really the case. Khalil Mack didn't win the Bears seven games. Their new head coach, Matt Nagy, helping their quarterback help them win seven games. We, I'll give the Bears two games. right? Maybe Khalil Mack has the difference of two games for the Bears. He put them over the top against the Dolphins. No, they lost the Dolphins. <laughs> See, that's my point. Um, here's the thing. I don't know that adding Khalil Mack would have really made a huge impact on the Raiders. It helped the Bears more than it would have the Raiders. And if the Raiders had had Khalil Mack, they wouldn't have been much better. And I actually think having Khalil Mack would have hurt the Raiders long term. Let's look at the position the Raiders are in right now. They have five draft picks in the next two, five first round draft picks in the next two NFL drafts. And they have a bunch of free cap room, a bunch of room to sign new players. If they'd kept Khalil Mack, they would have far less cap space, and they would have had a marginal season. They would have gone, what, 6-10, and 7-9. and nine. They'd have a middle-of-the-road draft pick. like They'd be picking 14th, and they wouldn't have five new draft picks in the next two rounds, in the next two drafts. Having five first-round draft picks is a massive, massive advantage. I think they have three first-round draft picks just this season. So getting rid of Amari Cooper, getting rid of Khalil Mack, both of those moves really, really helped the Raiders right now. Two players or five players? Young players, a bunch of second-round picks, first-round picks. I believe getting rid of Khalil Mack actually helped the Raiders long-term. It opened up a lot of cap space, and it gave them a lot of players they can add to their roster in the future. One defensive end is not enough to build a playoff roster. Five first-round draft picks, that just might. And so I think getting rid of Khalil Mack ultimately was the right decision by the Raiders for the long-term viability of their franchise. I know it hurts. I know it's ugly. It's hard to watch Khalil Mack be really successful with the Bears. But long-term, and with hindsight, that move was the right move for the Raiders. I will say, too, if the Raiders had been really close, like if the Raiders had just missed the playoffs, then you could criticize trading Khalil Mack all you want. But they weren't even close. They were a bad team. A bad team with one more good player doesn't make you suddenly a great team. Not, not a defensive end. A defensive end doesn't put you over the edge. Von Miller and Bradley Chubb are a prime example of two fantastic defensive ends that still could not make a difference for their franchises in De with the Denver Broncos. I just I don't see it. If the, if the Raiders had been close and they didn't make it, you could criticize the Khalil Mack trade all you want, but they weren't even close. And I really don't believe Khalil Mack would have made a huge impact and really helped the Raiders long-term. Okay, we're coming up on week two of the Alliance of American Football. Uh, it starts tomorrow. With any new league, you got to figure out where can I watch each of these games. I want to break it down for you guys, tell you where everybody's playing, and tell you who I believe will win each game. So the first game of the weekend on Saturday at 11 a.m. West Coast time, 2 p.m. Eastern time, the Salt Lake Stallions go to Birmingham to play the Birmingham Iron. You can watch this game on TNT. It's also streaming on Fubo TV, which is a, like a, a website you can buy. You can use a free trial, I think, for a week, and you can watch any of the games you want. I believe the Birmingham Iron are going to beat the Salt Lake Stallions. Uh, look, it's pretty simple. The, the Stallions' starting quarterback, Josh Woodrum, is out. That's a massive, massive blow. But not only that, the Birmingham Iron are really, really good. They're one of the best teams in the AAF. And so not, not only are the Stallions going to struggle to throw the ball, they had seven drop passes last week. They're also going to struggle to run the ball against the Birmingham Iron's really, really good front seven. I think the Birmingham Iron could walk away very easily dominating the Salt Lake Stallions in this game. Second game of the weekend, Saturday, 5 p.m. West Coast time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. The Arizona Hotshots travel to the Memphis Express. They travel to Memphis, play the Express. Uh, this game is on NFL Network. It's also, again, streaming on Fubo TV. And uh, I think the Arizona Hotshots should win this game comfortably, very, very easily. Memphis is not very good. 
Uh, they struggle to throw the ball. They can't. They really don't run the. They run the ball well, but they have no. They're one dimensional on offense. They play solid defense, but that's not enough. Uh, I think the Hot Shots, in contrast, are a far better team with a good quarterback, good offensive line, good wide receivers. They're all around one of the best teams in the Alliance of American Football. The Arizona Hot Shots should crush the Memphis Express on Saturday. The third game of the weekend is the early game on Sunday. It's at 1 p.m. Pacific time, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. This is the best game of the weekend if you're an Alliance of American Football fan. The San Antonio Commanders host the Orlando Apollo. This game is on CBS Sports Network. You can also stream it on CBS. It might be live on YouTube. Last time there was a game strictly on CBS Sports Network. It was also streaming live on YouTube. You type it in. You know, Orlando Apollo is at San Antonio Commanders. You might find it on YouTube. This is, again, Sunday, 1 p.m. East, uh, Pacific time, 4 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, this is a great matchup. These are probably very likely the two best teams in the entire Alliance of American football. Don't forget about the Birmingham Iron. Um, but the Apollos have a better quarterback, but the Commanders are better wide receivers. They have a better defensive front. going to be a really fun competitive game. I'm going to pick the San Antonio Commanders to win. It should be really, really close. Now, the fourth and final game of the weekend, Sunday night, 5 p.m. West Coast time, 8 p.m. Eastern time, you have the Atlanta Legends at the San Diego Fleet. Now, this game is also on NFL Network. Uh, you can stream it on Fubo TV. This is a uh, somewhat of a toilet bowl. The, the Atlanta Legends are awful, and the San Antonio Fleet, or the San Diego Fleet, excuse me, are one of the, the bottom half teams in the Alliance of American Football. Uh, I think the Fleet should win. They have a new starting quarterback this week, Philip Nelson. The question is can the San Diego Fleet line up properly and run their stuff and execute? If they can do that, they should beat the Atlanta Legends pretty easily. Again, the Atlanta Legends are simply not very good. That is the Alliance of American Football Week 2, and uh, I'm really excited to watch. I think it'll be really, really fun. I'll watch it from home. I'll have nachos in front of me, and uh, it should be really, really quite a blast to watch. Oh, man. Um, this, this really excites me. There was one trade, one thing that happened in the NBA recently that I am so, so excited about. I found myself watching basketball. And really, like, I had to look up, when is this game happening? When can I watch? And it really, really it motivated me to care about the NBA, which is what I love. That is, you can give me a reason to care about the NBA before the playoffs. That's a win. And this trade did, in fact, make me do that. So at the NBA trade deadline, at the NBA trade deadline, the Philadelphia 76ers traded for Tobias Harris, a for, uh, forward and uh, I love this move so, so much. It's a great move. It legitimizes the Philadelphia 76ers as a potential championship team. This is, I finally buy into the 76ers. A lot of people for years have been saying, we got all these stars. You know, we got Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, Jimmy Butler. Ah, ah, ah. I don't care. I don't buy it. The problem with the 76ers until this move was they didn't have good enough three-point shooting. They had one player, J.J. Redick, who's solid, but one three-point shooter is not enough to beat all the other great teams in the NBA. Now, Tobias Harris, the player the 76ers just traded for, is in the top 10 in NBA three-point percentage. He's shooting 43%, which is better than Klay Thompson. And for some perspective and for some context, Steph Curry, the star for the Warriors, is shooting 44% from behind the three-point line. This is a wonderful move because... It makes the Eastern Conference playoffs fascinating, really, really interesting. It's not a three-way, in my opinion, it's a three-way race. We'll, we'll throw on the other teams at the end. Uh, but between the Raptors, the Celtics, and the Philadelphia 76ers, I cannot wait to see which team wins the Eastern Conference Finals. I'll give a, some credit to the Bucks and the Pacers. They're actually ahead in the, the standings right now, ahead of the 76ers and the Celtics. But the point is the Eastern Conference playoffs are going to be really fun, really competitive. I cannot wait to watch because of this addition by the 76ers. I don't know. Now the 76ers have the bodies they need not only to compete, but possibly win the entire Eastern Conference. So here's what's cool about this move. Uh, first of all, after the move, the Philadelphia 76ers now only have one player on their starting five that's under six foot eight. That new amount of length gives the 76ers a lot of advantage, a lot of a great advantage on defense. They can use their length. They'll be really good down low. 
I, I like this. Look, they have two really good three-point shooters. They have Tobias Harris shooting 43% from behind the three-point line. They have J.J. Redick, who's shooting 39% from three-point range. Jimmy Butler has a great mid-range jumper. Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons dominate around the rim and down low. This trade is so good for the NBA. It makes me excited to watch. I watched the Celtics and 76ers the other day after this trade happened. Uh, the Celtics did win. The Celtics won 112 to 109, but it's early. There's still a lot of chemistry that needs to be developed on the 76ers roster. They're running a lot of isolation. And it, they had a couple miscues. It looked like they just don't know each other very well. Uh, but this is, this is a really, really fascinating move around the NBA. I can't wait to watch what happens for the 76ers down the road. I don't know. Uh, I think a really fun championship would be the 76ers and the Golden State Warriors. It might be that the Warriors just shoot the 76ers out of the gym. Very possible. But I would love to see the way the 76ers play the Warriors on defense. What kind of matchup? Because they have great players down low. Watching Joel Embiid and Kevin Durant or Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. I don't know who's going to guard Steph Curry. I just If that works out, I would love to see what happened and see the way the 76ers matched up with the Golden State Warriors. And if somehow the Warriors, you know, break apart this offseason, it could really open the door for another team like the Celtics or the 76ers, maybe even the Raptors, if they can keep Kawhi Leonard around to step in and win a championship. That is what I want to see in the NBA. I, I'm not, I have a hard time watching the Warriors win every single year. You know, we're, what, it's February right now, and I still, I feel like the Warriors are absolutely the favorite to win the NBA Finals. You can complain about the New England Patriots winning the Super Bowl every single year, but at least week eight, halfway through the season, we don't feel like, oh, it's the Patriots are going to win it all again. At least there's drama that's interesting. And uh, right now, the drama that interests me in the NBA is leading up to the NBA championship. The Eastern Conference Finals are great, and then I'm not going to care as much about the finals because I think the Warriors are going to win. Um, but at least, hey, it could be interesting. Who knows? Um, but the 76ers being in the mix now really, really piques my interest and really, really fascinates me. I want to go back to the trade real quick. The reason why the LA Clippers traded Tobias Harris away to the 76ers, because they were, you know, Tobias Harris has an expiring contract. And the reason why the Celtics don't want to re-sign Tobias Harris is because he's not good enough really to build an entire team around. And so the Celtics were hoping to trade him away and clear their cap space. And then the thought process is maybe the Celtics can sign two really big free agents in the 2019 offseason. They can sign maybe Clay Thompson and Kawhi Leonard, something like that. This trade really, really benefited the LA Clippers. They got two first-round draft picks, two second-round draft picks. They got a solid rookie, Landry Shamet. They also got two role players, um, Mike Muscala and Wilson Chandler. The 76ers really only got Tobias Harris. They got two other role players, uh, Boban Marjanovic and Mike Scott, but... It's, this is not the Boban. No, none of these other parts matter. The only part of this trade that matters to me is the fact that the 76ers got Tobias Harris. Uh, now, it is worth noting that the, the number one problem with the 76ers right now is their bench. They didn't have a bench before the trade. They have even less of a bench after the trade. But that's the problem with every single super team is that their bench is depleted because there's only so much money to go around. I don't really care about the 76ers bench. I'm excited to watch their starting five in the playoffs and see how they match up against a team like the Celtics, the Raptors, and maybe even the Golden State Warriors. I am so excited about the 76ers after the Tobias trade. I care, I'm invested, and I cannot wait to watch. We have two topics I want to talk about left. Um, first of all is this. Please stop talking about Kyler Murray's height. He's five foot nine. Kyler Murray is a short quarterback. He won the Heisman, but he's, he's a short quarterback. We can all acknowledge. But please stop telling me that Kyler Murray is going to have trouble seeing over the offensive line. Newsflash, nobody, nobody sees over the offensive line. It's so frustrating and weird to me. You know, Aaron Rodgers is six foot two. A lot of his offensive linemen are six seven. Six foot eight, six foot nine. You think Aaron Rodgers can see up over a six foot nine offensive lineman? No, nobody does. Quarterbacks see between their linemen in the windows between where they are. Nobody sees over their offensive linemen. I think it's so weird. We're still somehow still in 2019. We still have conversations about, hmm, can a short quarterback work in the NFL? Yes, 
Yes, yes, yes. In a year that Baker Mayfield just broke the rookie record for touchdown passes, he's a short quarterback. Russell Wilson, Drew Brees, we've had plenty of short quarterbacks succeed in the past. Why are we still stuck on this narrative? I don't know if people are bored and don't know what to talk about. I think maybe they're making drama out of nothing, but Kyler Murray's height is not the problem. I play quarterback in college. You see between your linemen. Nobody, again, I repeat, nobody looks over the top of their offensive linemen. It's ridiculous. It's silly. If you want to evaluate Kyler Murray, look at his decision-making. Look at his leadership skills. Look at other things that matter. Don't look at his height. His height doesn't matter. Maybe, here's a great concern. If you're concerned that Kyler Murray's too small, like his body weight, that he's going to get hurt, that's a fair criticism. But his height alone, the fact that he's five foot nine, is not enough of a thing to criticize and be worried about. Short quarterbacks have made it in the past. Short quarterbacks will continue to make it in the future. Please come up with a better argument. If you're going to criticize Kyler Murray, please come up with something else other than criticizing his height because that is just silly. It's dumb. It's not worth talking about, and it's getting really, really old really, really fast. Okay. Um, final thing I want to talk about today, a weird show, a short show. Um, I'm trying to get out of here. I got to leave in a couple hours to get out and go to go home for the weekend. Um, I recently moved schools. I transferred from Washington State University. I moved to Pacific Lutheran in Tacoma, Washington. And for a period of about, about a month, for about a month, I was just waiting. I was in limbo because I needed my financial aid paperwork and information figured out, and I'd done everything I could. I, just, I was at the mercy of this office. It was out of my control. I was just waiting, and I was told as a student by the office that it would be, first they told me, it'll be here by Friday. Well, Friday came and went, and I didn't have the paperwork I needed. And they said, well, uh, next Friday you'll have what you need. And then that came and went, and then it was next Friday, and then it was next Friday again. And finally, it went all the way down to the final day, the final deadline. One day left, like hours left. I got the paperwork I needed. I got admitted into the school, and I knew what I was doing next. But the weird part was I had no control over my next move. I've never experienced anything like that, where my future was completely out of my hands. It was bizarre. I was stressed. I was crippled. I couldn't do anything. You know, I was just, I would like, I would try to write for my podcast, and I was stuck at home going, and I, I just couldn't do anything. It was awful. I imagine that's how an NBA player feels right around the NBA All-Star break. You know, when there's rumors and your name's all around there, and People are talking, maybe he's going to trade it, maybe he's not, and it comes right down to the very end. You're probably just really, really stressed because you have no control over what happens to you next. So the Dallas Mavericks traded Harrison Barnes in the middle of a game, and LeBron James was really upset about it. Here's what LeBron James had to say about this on Instagram. This is LeBron James' Instagram post, and I quote, so let me guess, this is cool because they had to do what was best for their franchise, Right? Traded this man while he was literally playing in the game and had zero idea. I'm not knocking who traded him because it's a business and you have to do what you feel is best. I just want this narrative to change, to start getting real change, not when a player wants to be traded or leaves a franchise that he's selfish, ungrateful, but when they trade you, release, wave, cut, etc. It's best for them. I'm okay with both, honestly. Just call a spade a spade. The point of this thing was LeBron was saying, there's a double standard in the way we treat players. If a team trades away a player, it's all business. It's nothing personal. It's, we're doing what's best for business. But if a player leaves a city, for some reason, especially fans freak out, it's mad, you're not loyal, you're disrespectful, it's awful, la la la. And uh, I agree with LeBron James' sentiment wholeheartedly. You know, it's weird. I, I've, I've transferred schools multiple times. I transferred in high school. I did it again in college. I've left certain jobs to go get other better jobs. It's okay to move. It's okay to have some fluctuation. It's okay to go somewhere else to find a better opportunity. But the way we treat athletes when they leave a program, when they transfer high schools, when they transfer colleges, when they leave a NBA franchise to go to another NBA franchise, when you leave a Kirk Cousins left for another place and people got mad at him, the way we treat athletes when they leave is so weird. It's so bizarre to me. And there's a complete double standard. You know, the, the Ravens traded away Joe Flacco, and people on the Ravens side were so excited. They're like, yes, 
We got rid of our bad quarterback and our bad contract. No one talked about the fact that, how does Joe Flacco feel about this? My point is this, we do what's best for us. Uh, you know, as, as normal people, not athletes. We go do whatever we want. If we need to have a better job, we go after a better job. If we want a better apartment, we go find a better apartment. But the minute an athlete does what's best for them, there's a weirdness where we, we don't like it, we're not okay with it, and, and fans especially really, really go after certain athletes. It's so weird to me. It's so weird to hate someone for leaving for better opportunity. I mean, I guess the point is fans are irrational, right? Fans, especially in college football, fans are crazy. Like Washington State fans in my last college would always write into me say, my team has a chance to win the national championship. It's like, no, you don't. You're you're unbelievably irrational and delusional if you think the Washington State Cougars had a chance to win a national championship. But um, I just think the double standard, the way we treat players is so weird and bizarre. Uh, and I'm not a fan. You know, if a, if a team trades a player and it's a business move, that's fine. But if a player leaves a franchise to go have a better opportunity, that's also a business move. And you can't get really, I mean, you can, but it's irrational to get really mad at a player when they leave for a better opportunity because that is what we all do. We want a better apartment. We want a better job. We want to go to a better school. People move all the time. And so the fact that we treat athletes differently when they try to go after a better opportunity is just weird to me. I think it needs to end. I think it's very bizarre. I hope years from now we don't do this with players where when a player leaves and goes to another city, no one gets mad and freaks out at them. We go, oh, makes sense. He's doing what's best for him. Guys, that's all I have today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, I really, really appreciate it. Remember, you can find this show on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, whatever you want. Help me grow on, you know, by telling your friends about the show on Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is. And I hope you have a great weekend. A lot of good games this weekend. Um, I'm, I'm tired. I probably sound tired. I sound really weird. Um, it's, uh, I'm ready to go home and sleep. It's been a long week. College is uh, week two. I already had a paper due. It's really uh, not exciting. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again. I'll probably, I'll probably do my next episode on Tuesday. I'm traveling. I'm coming home Sunday night which means I'll probably want a whole weekend to, you know, another, I want a Monday to prepare and write some stuff and get stuff ready. Um, and uh, I don't know. I got a, sh I got a topic on Jimmy Garoppolo I'm working on that I don't, I'm scared to share. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of research. I've been on a lot of watching Jimmy Garoppolo. And I, I think what I have to say won't make 49ers fans happy. I've been sitting on it. I haven't shared it because I have all this video evidence and I have all this stuff to say. And you know, I think Jimmy Garoppolo was in incredibly disappointing in 2018, and um, I'm not excited to tell to share that with people because I know I'm gonna get probably a lot of hate and backlash for it. So I've been I've been you know sitting on it for a while, and I'll probably do that on Tuesday. Talk about Jimmy Garoppolo's struggles and why he did so bad and why he did so poorly. Uh, we'll do that on Tuesday, guys. Thank you so much. That's all I have. But um, bam, we are done. Bye.